This is London. Keep off the streets as much as possible. Carry your gas mask with you always. For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall never surrender. It was August 9, 1941, occupied France. A cool, brisk 62 degrees off the coast. Douglas Botter was on patrol. The head of a Spitfire squadron, four strong. The tension was palatable, but the skies were clear. And then, it happened. A squad of 12 ME-109s lurking below. Without a second thought, he dove after them. But that dive was too steep. In a split second, he disappeared. It was a gutsy move and set off one of the most bizarre stories of World War II. You see, the simple fact is, Douglas Botter had no legs. The Roaring Twenties, England. They called it that for a reason. World War I was over, and a sense of liberation and optimism filled the air. Flappers, the Charleston, and Lindbergh were all the rage. And so was the dream of flight. Doug got his first look at these new marvels when he visited his sister and her husband, a flight lieutenant in the newly formed Royal Air Force at Cranwell University. It was no surprise that at 18, he joined the RAF. But by the age of 21, it all came crashing down. During the Hendon Air Show in 1931, he took his boldness too far. His squadron was prepping to defend the title in the pairs event. Two pilots had already been killed attempting aerobatics, and there were strict orders to stick above 500 feet. But on a dare, he took his low-level aerobatics to the edge. As he did a roll, he grazed the ground and slammed into the grassy field. He survived, but Doc Joyce had to amputate both legs. Being Douglas Botter, that didn't slow him down. You see, Doug was a force of nature. He defied the odds. He even wrote in his logbook, slow rolling near the ground, bad show. That was Doug. It was a long recovery, and his crew didn't see him much until 1932 when he was fitted with a new pair of legs. Within months, it took him no time to start dancing, playing golf, and even burning up the road once again. I'm sure that's why he bought this MG Roadster in 1938. He couldn't get enough. At this point, there was nothing old Tin Legs couldn't do. But could he climb back into a cockpit? Without skipping a beat, he took to the skies in an Avro 504. There were no regulations for a man with no legs to enlist, let alone re-enlist, so they rejected him. But he didn't give up. He spent years asking the RAF to take him back. And in 1939, his persistence paid off. Britain declared war on Germany. I'm sure they needed all the help they could get. Is it possible they do not realize that we shall never cease to persevere against them? until they have been taught a lesson which they and the world will never forget. Doug was accepted back into the RAF after a successful flight test at the Central Flying School. In fact, when he got his chance to fly solo in an Avro Tudor, he could not resist the chance to flaunt his ability. And once again, we found him upside down just 600 feet off the ground. But there was no time for disciplinary actions. A war was on. Doug laid eyes on his first Spitfire when he was appointed to his squad and couldn't wait to take one up. Those Spitfires were beautiful, but temperamental. During one takeoff, his plane crashed. 
As fate would have it, his prosthetic legs were the only damage. He knew right then and there, he would have lost the real ones for sure. Well, he brushed himself off, and with his amazing skills, he got promoted and soon became flight commander of Squad 222. He fought at the Battle of Dunkirk, shooting down two and saving the troops stranded on the beach. He switched over to Squad 242 and got his feet wet in a Hawker hurricane. He fought in the Battle of Britain and helped stop the Germans cold. He became a fearless morale booster for the men. And by 1941, this fighter race had racked up 20 kills. This one time, hurling towards the enemy, he even had the audacity to arrange a game of squash over the radio for later that day. Everyone knew who he was, and when he got promoted to wing commander, he painted his initials DB on his plane. Soon, he was flying patrols over France. And that brings us to August 9th, 1941. As the rest of the boys headed towards the squad of Messerschmitts, Doug's Spitfire was in a head-first dive, guns blazing through the formation. Before he knew it, he was alone. The protocol for pilots in this situation was to turn and head home, not for Douglas Botter. When he leveled off, he spotted eight more 109s, and without thinking, he got two of them. As he pulled away, everything went haywire. The back end of his plane was gone, and the ground was heading up fast. As he tried to bail out, his leg got stuck. The strap was holding him in. A quick pull of his parachute pulled him free. But now, he was in enemy territory, minus a leg. The episode knocked him out. Badly injured, they took him to a hospital close by in St. Omer. Later, he claimed he collided with one of the 109s. But recent reports suggest he was shot down by friendly fire. Now you'd think he'd try to recover, but that's not Doug. Soon he was dangling out of his hospital window by a rope made with bed sheets. The Germans had found his missing leg, and he managed to fix it, just enough to give him a chance to escape and hide just outside of town. But later, on the 15th of August, the Germans caught up with him, and he was immediately shipped out to be interrogated. The people who helped him were sent to a concentration camp, but survived the war. There's an unwritten code of respect between fighter pilots, no matter what side they are on. When Luftwaffe ace Adolf Golan, who just went up against Bader's group, invited him over to his airfield for dinner, he let Doug sit in his personal 109. Under guard, of course. Adolf saw Doug's half-working leg, and amazingly, he got the green light from Hermann Goring himself to have the British airdrop Doug a new leg. And even more amazing, British command agreed. Well, sort of. They would only deliver it on their terms, to avoid giving the Germans publicity. On August 19th, Operation Leg took to the skies. During a bombing mission to a power station, a group of Bristol Blenheims took a slight detour to St. Omer and airdropped Botter's new leg. What a sight it must have been to see a single package dropping out of a bombing formation with some tobacco, chocolate, and one right artificial limb. The flight ended up being one of the most unique of the war. Weather over the target prevented the Blenheims from attacking the power station. So instead, they shot up an airfield on their way back, and it just happened to be Adolf Golan's. This was history in the making, and Botter sure put that new leg to good use. He stated he would be a pain-bloody nuisance to the Germans, and old Doug was good to his word. Ironically, out of the many prison camps Doug spent his time in, none of them could contain him. He taunted, played pranks, and disrupted the prison guards every chance he got. The boys called it goon baiting. It was exciting to his fellow prisoners, and at the same time, annoying as hell. Especially to those who got caught up in the punishments for his behavior. Bader also participated in many escape attempts, using his way of goon baiting as a distraction. The guards even threatened to take away his legs every single night. Despite this, 
he finally had his chance and escaped once more during his time in Stulaf Loot 3, the same camp the movie The Great Escape is based on. He would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for his fame. You see, a pilot from Galan's fighter group stopped by to meet him and the plot was foiled. When Germans spread posters around town, they said to be on the lookout for a man walking with a cane. The funny thing is, Botter was a master at operating those legs, and he never once used one. That was August 18th, 1942. Well, the Germans had just about enough of Doug's antics and sent him to an escape-proof prison at Kolditz Castle. He remained there until 1945, causing trouble every chance he got. After the war, Douglas Botter was given the honor of leading a formation of 300 to celebrate the victory over Europe. He took a post as the Central Flight School's commanding officer, but found he was mostly instructing pilots on the ground. He didn't get along with the new generation, who considered him out of date, believe it or not. Doug retired from the RAF in 1946. Later, he took a job at the Royal Dutch Shell Company, where he was able to continue flying as the managing director of Shell Aircraft until he retired in 1969. Operation Leg became one of the most bizarre stories in the war, and they even made a movie about him in 1956. He died in 1982, and among the many personalities and heads of state who attended the funeral was Adolf Galan. They shared an enduring friendship for 40 years after the war.